Thank you very much, Theo Lorenz. Thank you very much uh, to um, um, the AA Public Programs for inviting me. Uh, congratulations to this um, beautiful um, uh, fashion statement. Uh, we are talking here actually about um, a flag uh, that was designed by a Bauhaus designer um, who um, is almost forgotten. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a very good times to remember his work, the Antifa flag. So, but please take a seat. Thank you very much for for showing this uh, intervention. <laughs> That's my program uh, for the next 45 minutes. Um, I will talk about, uh, obviously, the relationship of architecture and ideology, about um, what I call right-wing spaces. I will introduce you to a typology, and I will end up with a different interpretation of the AA that is here manifested in these uh, beautiful uh, hoodies called Antifa architecture. Uh, I will talk about, uh, as I mentioned already, about uh, another version of AA. But before I go into that, I would like to share with you a couple of thoughts about the relationship of architecture and ideology. Um, probably this place here in Moscow is the best place in the world to talk about the relationship of architecture and ideology. We see here building a, um, an Orthodox church constructed in the 1830s, and it was demolished exactly 100 years later by Stalin, who wanted to replace this old um, uh, this, uh, building by um, a project that you probably all have heard about. I'm talking about the Palace of Soviets. Uh, there was a famous competition. Boris Yofan, one of the one of uh, Stalin's favorite architects, won this competition, and um, this building should replace the um, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church, the Christ of the Savior uh, Cathedral in Moscow. Uh, Construction started for this building, but then the Second World War started and the construction uh, was interrupted. But there was um, already uh, something constructed that I will show you in a minute. But before I show you this, I would like to um, make a, a, a quick comparison to what actually happened in an other in an alternative ideological context in the US at the same time. So King Lenin uh, on the left-hand side versus King Kong on the right-hand side. He, the, uh, I, I see here kind of uh, uh, interesting comparison between competing regimes, let's call them liberalism on the one hand and com communism on the other hand. But let's go back to Moscow. What happened to the the, to the started construction uh, in Moscow, uh, the foundations were constructed, and uh, after the Second World War, uh, people in Moscow asked themselves, what shall we do with this foundation uh, of the Palace of the Soviets? Let's build there a public pool. And um, in this Moscow pool, you could swim until the early 1990s in a, um, yeah, in a kind of uh, uh, beautiful version of uh, socialism um, existing in reality. In the middle of the 1990s, this pub uh, highly successful public building was deeply questioned, and the the old cathedral was reconstructed again. Well, most of uh, you might know this building from uh, Pussy Riot actions um, against uh, the uh, Orthodox Church and um, other um, political and religious movements in Russia. So by showing you this sequence, I definitely wanted to make clear that there is an obvious, uh, that there is a relationship between architecture and ideology, but it's actually pretty difficult to draw exact um, um, yeah, relationships between a built form and a certain ideology. The most famous example is the so-called classicist tradition. We see here a deeply democratic building. It's a parliament in Helsinki built in the 1930s by an architect called Siren, a Finnish architect. And if you close your eye for two seconds and open it 
again, now you see only 10 differences. Uh, we see a pseudo parliament in North Korea called the Mansudei Assembly Hall. Again, uh, a colossal order, uh, a kind of building that is um, part of a long tradition of classicist traditions, uh, but obviously with completely different um, uh, ideological contexts uh, surrounded. Um, and similar things could be said about modern architecture. The most famous example is this one. I'm sure you have all seen images of this building. Uh, still today, uh, a building worth to visit. Um, uh, the Casa de Fascia, the house for the fascists in Como, designed by Giuseppe Terrani, an Italian fascist architect, completed in 1936. It's still standing today. Today, the uh, f finance police of Italy is, uh, is having uh, their uh, offices in there, at least for the uh, region in uh, Como. And the interesting thing about this building is not only the built artifact, but also the history of its reception. Peter Eisenman is one of the biggest fans of this building. He's also a great fan of Giuseppe Terrani. And uh, of course, when I'm talking about Peter Eisenman, I'm definitely talking not about a fascist. Uh, he's probably an anti-fascist, but still is highly interested in uh, the kind of, um, yeah, the built artifact, the complexities of uh, the Casa del Fajo designed by Giuseppe Terrani. He um, defends the architecture, obviously, um, for autonomous reasons, for reasons that uh, have something to do with the idea of an autonomy of architecture. Uh, there's also a building in Germany between Stuttgart and Karlsruhe in a little town called Pforzheim. And obviously, this again is a building not inhabited by fascists, not designed by fascists, but there is uh, obviously a strong relationship to the Casa del Fascio in Como. What I'm trying to say with this little sequence is that there's obviously not a right wing or left wing architecture, but that there are right wing spaces. Um, that have something to do with territorializing processes, etc. I will come back to this in a second. But before uh, I do that, I do this. I uh, would like to share with you a couple of thoughts about this um, left versus right dichotomy. Um, there are many intellectuals, um, um, prominent intellectuals, who think that sp uh, talking about left versus right is itself deeply reactionary. It's a, it's, uh, these are terms from, from an old uh, world. And uh, yeah, one of the intellectuals who is associated with this kind of um, ideas is definitely Francis Fukuyama, an American liberal philosopher. He published uh, a book in the early 1990s, right after the uh, fall of the Iron Curtain, called The End of History and the Last Man. The idea of this book was basically to say that with the fall of the Iron Curtain, the history came to an end. Uh, the Western idea of, uh, of liberalism has succeeded. Uh, there's nothing else to uh, say about uh, history of ideology. Um, but when this book was printed, uh, it was actually already um, uh, a document of the past, uh, because at least in Europe, uh, um, a terrible war started, a civil war in former Yugoslavia. And there's also a philosopher, a Slovenian philosopher, a philosopher from former uh, Yugoslavia called Slava Cisek, who thought carefully about this dichotomy left versus right. And and um, he published an article in a um, book uh, that uh, uh, that was uh, published a couple of years ago in 2017 called The Great Regression. It's a kind of panorama of the complexities or the political complexities that we are surrounded um, by at the moment. And in that uh, book, there's an essay by Slava Zizek who um, thought carefully about uh, left versus right and, and came to the end that he basically said that 
left versus right is not the polarity of um, our contemporary condition anymore. He actually suggests that uh, left, the idea left versus right should be replaced by a cruciform uh, form of a combination of two axes, um, the universality, the idea of universality versus patriotic belonging on the one hand, and then capitalism versus leftist anti-capitalism on the other hand. I um, found these um, arguments uh, pretty convincing and uh, started uh, to uh, establish a diagram based on some of the ideas of Slava Cizek, which uh, looks like that in the end. Again, we see here the combination of two cruciform polarities, uh, the idea of universalism uh, versus patriotic belonging or patriotic nationalism on the one hand versus global capitalism on the uh, other hand versus uh, anti-globalist uh, left. Um, and I added a few words to this diagram that is inspired by Slavoj Cezic by saying that there's obviously a duplicated left and there's a duplicated right. So there, there are two versions of right-wing politics and there are also two versions of left-wing politics. And there are many, many combinations and in between uh, stages between these extremes that are uh, mapped by this diagram. One combination is, for example, the, what we call in German language the queer font, a kind of third position, a combination of socialist ideas with nationalism. The result uh, we know is national socialism, basically. And uh, there's also another uh, combination, possible um, progressive liberalism. That's a term by the American philosopher Nancy Fraser, who said that there's an uh, obviously a, a, a very uh, good uh, synergy available between the idea of a kind of leftist universalism uh, combined with a global capitalism. And maybe politicians like Angela Merkel or Hillary Clinton are actually uh, the personifications of the idea of progressive liberalism. I'm trying to argue that uh, every version or every possibility of architecture theory has to be situated in this map somewhere. So there's always some kind of implicit or also explicit political argument that can be placed somewhere there. And if we look at biographies of certain architects and architecture theoreticians, uh, we can also uh, sense this, uh, a moving uh, field. Um, former Marxists became nationalists. I will uh, speak about that in a second. And I will, would like to start with one Example, an Hungarian architect who was very prominent when I studied architecture in the uh, early 1990s. Um, his name is Imre Makovets. He uh, is not living anymore. Um, but he became very well known in Hungary, but also uh, in Europe for buildings like this here, kind of strong, um, yeah, anthropomorphic architecture, very physiognomic architecture, uh, which is definitely interesting. There's also influence um, um, det detectable maybe by Rudolf Steiner and expressionist architecture. But if we look at the soundtrack uh, of uh, Imre Makovets, um, the, um, the, yeah, uh, it might be surprising that Imre Makovets was a, uh, uh, yeah, was a right-wing uh, architect and right-wing architecture theorist who was also deeply anti-Semitic and was very close to um, Viktor Orban, who um, long before uh, Viktor Orban became prime minister of Hungary, he was uh, part of uh, his polit political movement called Fidesz. And uh, yeah, Imre Makovets said basically um, uh, some very disturbing things about Jewish intellectuals, Jewish Hungarian intellectuals like Agnes Heller or Georgi Konrad, quote, um, I can't leave it out even if if I stand on my hand. They always have something to criticize the Hungarian nation for. They have a superiority complex. They live with the idea of being the chosen people. They're obviously a kind of uh, strongly anti-Semitic statement by an architect who we associate with, an, um, with expressionist architecture in the widest sense of the word. I would like to give you a second example, um, an example 
um, uh, of an architect and architecture theorist who also taught here at this place. His name is Leon Creer. Uh, Leon Creer, um, an architect that uh, I, uh, I respect many of his drawings and uh, some of his thoughts, but and if you look at this diagram, you see a question mark behind Leon Creer. The question mark is there because Leon Creer always tries to stress, I'm not a political person, I'm an artist. Um, I would love to build for leftists, but they don't give me a commission. That's why I prefer right-wing politicians right at the moment. Um, but this ideological orientation um, uh, became deeply problematic already in the 1980s when he uh, produced a kind of coffee table uh, book on the work of Hitler's uh, architect Albert Speer, um, which of course you can write uh, historiographic books and you should write actually historiographic books on Albert Speer, but um, not uh, this kind of books in my opinion. If you open this book, it's still available and there's a second edition available um, from, the, it was published in 2013. He even tried to improve and tuned the, um, some of the uh, drawings of Albert Speer and tried to basically neutralize the political implications um, of many of the projects and buildings and uh, tried to say this is the greatest architect Germany has seen in the 20th century. And for many, many people, including me, it was not at all surprising that Leon Creer um, um, began to publish uh, uh, two or three years ago in ultra right wing magazines called Kato in Germany. Uh, so it's uh, it's a kind of AfD magazine you could uh, call it. And uh, in every second or third edition, Leon Creer writes an article about beautiful architecture. And uh, Kato is obviously also um, very happy to reproduce uh, drawings by Leon Creer like this, uh, where. Um, Obviously, Leon Creer tries to criticize the idea of modernist pluralism and tries to defend um, the idea of a traditional pluralism by uh, representing the idea of traditional pluralism uh, with uh, obviously an idea of ethnic purity. Um, so deeply, I, I called this drawing a racist drawing uh, um, a, a couple of months ago. Ron Moore by The Guardian uh, and The Observer wrote about this uh, little battle battle between Leon Creer and, and myself, and uh, yeah, the, the argument of uh, Leon Creer you can still read in this um, article. Um, I would like to come back to the idea of right-wing spaces, of, uh, about what I call, what I try to call right-wing spaces. Um, one year ago, a bit less than one year ago, I published together with my institute of the University of Stuttgart, this edition of uh, the German architecture magazine Eichplus called Right-Wing Spaces. It's a report of a journey throughout Europe. And this journey we uh, did together with our students uh, at Stuttgart University, it started in Rome and it ended in Berlin. So we uh, tried to uh, reenact, so to say, a highly problematic axis, Rome, uh, uh, Rome Berlin. It's, a, uh, it's an axis with uh, political implications that go back to fascism, um, um, respectively national socialism. And on this journey, we tried to find out ways how uh, historical architectures of fascism get rediscovered in contemporary politics. Politics. And we looked at Greece, we looked at countries like Spain. We, and the journey started um, at this building, which is very close to um, the main station in Rome. It's a building called Casa Pound. Casa Pound is a uh, neo-fascist political movement in Italy. It, uh, for a long time, it was also, it, it became a political party. And um, this Casa Pound is named after the American poet Ezra Pound, who became a, um, a fan of Benito Mussolini and uh, also uh, wrote poems about Italian fashions. I will come back to this in a minute. And uh, this building, um, we analyzed not only this building, but also the urban infrastructure around it, because we found out it, and it was uh, well known. Um, it, it 
didn't need us to discover this, that around this headquarter of this political movement, a whole urban infrastructure consisting of bars, of bookshops, of fashion stores, uh, all run by fascists and offering kind of fascist products, uh, you can discover in the middle of Rome. And um, the journey continued. We uh, traveled up to the north. We went to um, Mussolini's birth house. We uh, looked at the, uh, uh, the uh, headquarter of um, the Italian right-wing party Lega, Lega Nord formerly. Uh, we analyzed the spaces around this headquarter. We also looked at Hitler's birthplace, which uh, there's a, uh, right now a com uh, architectural competition going on, what should be done with this um, uh, birth house of Adolf Hitler, who became a kind of magnet for many, many neo-Nazis uh, in Europe and beyond. And um, we also analyzed um, kind of public memorials like the so-called Kiffhäuser Denkmal in Germany. Uh, I can't go into the details of this, but we also tried to analyze, for example, whole settlements in Germany, uh, not only in the eastern part of Germany, where neo-fascists, neo-Nazis kind of take over uh, parts of uh, uh, abandoned villages in the countryside and establish their kind of um, uh, living based on ideas of white supremacy and ethnic purity. And the journey ended in Berlin. It started with Esther Pound, with this building called Casa Pound, and it ended uh, on a public square in Berlin called Walter Benjamin Platz, uh, designed by the German architect Hans Koloff, completed in 2001. And we, um, we kind of criticized the fact that in the middle of the square, dedicated to Walter Benjamin, a German Jewish uh, philosopher who um, uh, committed suicide uh, while he tried to escape uh, Nazism um, in the north of Spain. In the middle of the square dedicated to Benito, um, uh, uh, dedicated to Valle Benjamin, you could find a poem by Ezra Pound. Um, and uh, Hans Koloff basically uh, um, was the person who put it there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the square. The whole architecture was inspired by Mussolini's favorite architect, Marcello Piacentini, it's basically a, a quotation of, um, of a, a building in Torino by Piacentini. And that's a little quote you could find in the middle of the square. It's not very prominent. Most people have never seen it. Uh, most people only realize the fact that there is a quote in the middle of the square, which is basically more or less the program of the whole square, um, by the public debate that started when we published this architecture magazine called Arch Plus. What was to be written there? In German, um, it's, it's a basically a quote um, that is saying, um, under the conditions of usura, um, uh, there's a good architecture is not possible. And if you know only a little bit about the work of Ezra Pound, you know that usura is basically um, um, a code for um, for uh, for uh, for Jews. So basically, in the middle of this square called um, Walter Benjamin Platz, uh, there was a, uh, a quote saying that um, uh, with Jews there is no good architecture possible. We um, we uh, work together with a friend of ours called. He's, uh, his name is Markus Miesen, a Berlin-based architect who also, I think, studied and taught here at the school. And um, he produced this um, poster series, and we basically filled up uh, the city of Berlin um, with uh, these kind of um, uh, posters saying, where we try to establish a kind of a similarity, Benito, Benito Mussolini, Marcello, Marcello Piacentino, the favorite architect of Mussolini, Ezra, Ezra Pound, and Hans, Hans Koloff. We, we didn't try to say that Hans Koloff is a fascist, but um, we simply wanted to criticize the fact that this quote um, was um, brought to this public square. And uh, 
big debate in Germany started also in Austria and Switzerland. Um, basically every uh, newspaper, every uh, um, kind of TV station, radio station reported about this debate, started uh, by us and um, to our surprise, not many people wanted to follow us. They tried to f defend the autonomy of poetry represented by Esther Pound and didn't want to um, make a specific link to um, Esther Pound's anti-Semitism. So a kind of similar process was going on. The, auto the idea of autonomy in architecture plus the idea of autonomy in poetry was combined in order to, to neutralize this uh, statement by Hans Koloff slash Esther Pound on a square dedicated to Walter Benjamin. But Suddenly, a year later, and the debate was still going on in Germany, almost on a daily basis, um, something changed. Suddenly, Alan Posener, the son, by the way, of Julius Posener, the famous um, architecture historian, wrote a big article in the German daily newspaper called Die Welt with the title, yes, there is anti-Semitic architecture. And this um, changed something profoundly. Suddenly, the the um, parliamentary representation of the borough in Charlottenburg, Berlin, uh, decided that this uh, quote needs to be um, kind of, uh, yeah, it, uh, it should be demolished, basically. And, uh, but, and, uh, and there was a decision by the public um, parliament in, in Berlin, Charlottenburg, to do this. But then the question arose, who's the owner, actually, of the square? It turned out that it's not the public. It's not a public square. It, it, it is uh, owned by a private owner. Um, and um, the big question was, who's the owner, actually, of this building? And uh, some people found out, actually, another journalist found out that the owner is Blackstone, one of the biggest companies uh, in the world who bought this uh, building, uh, I think, in 2016 for several hundred million euros. And um, on this, in this article, again, in Die Welt, uh, the journalist Markus Wöller was the first person who brought, who, who linked the name of the company directly to anti-Semitism. If you know only a little bit about Blackstone, you know that uh, Stephen Schwarzman uh, um, uh, um, uh, is the CEO and chairman and also founder of Blackstone, a Jewish-American um, uh, entrepreneur. And only two days later, the, um, the quote was gone. Um, it was interesting to see the reactions. Most newspaper, newspapers didn't write about that. Uh, but in the commentaries of some newspapers, people said, OK, Usura um, made the Usura quote gone, in a way. So it's, a, again, a kind of a debate with uh, anti-Semitic implications. It now looks like that. I hope this works. If you come to the Water Benjamin Platz now, it looks like that. There it is. The quote is gone, replaced by um, provisional temporary architecture consisting of uh, timber. I actually like uh, the status quo because uh, one of the pseudonyms of uh, Walter Benjamin during National Socialism was Holz, Detlef Holz, uh, in English timber. Uh, so it, it almost uh, by an accident, um, by a strange accident, Walter Benjamin is more present uh, on this place than before. I would like to come back to the kind of third chapter of uh, my uh, presentation, where I would like to introduce you to uh, my typology of right-wing spaces in Germany and beyond. And I would like to start with the idea of a kind of single, the lonesome house. Uh, I start here with a private house owned by one of the most prominent theater playwriters in Germany called Boto Strauss. He's actually a pretty conservative and I would even say a right-wing guy who publishes in magazines like Der Spiegel um, essays where he says 
sentence is like this here. I would rather live in a dying but vital nation, he uses the uh, German word Volk, than in one that is being rejuvenated by being mixed together with foreign peoples, primarily on the basis of economic and demographic speculations. Um, uh, Butter Strauss became uh, one of the key um, uh, intellectuals for the so-called German Nouvelle Droite, uh, the, the, the new right-wing um, uh, kind of intellectuals. And when he became this figure, he moved into this little building uh, where, uh, that's his essay in the north of uh, Berlin, where he also wrote a little novel um, by, uh, where he basically describes uh, uh, kind of uh, taking his son out for a walk around his house and, uh, and uh, learning about the countryside and uh, uh, learning to ignore uh, the idea of, um, uh, learning to, to neglect the idea of, of the idea of a mix of different peoples. So, and there are many um, buildings you can find uh, in Germany and also beyond Germany, of course, uh, by owned by ultra right wing politicians, uh, which have to be interpreted as buildings that are the big beginning of something, the beginning, the beginning of a of a of a new settlement based on the idea of ethnic purity. For example, here, the idea of a neo-Nazi politician called Udo Pasteurs. It's a new building uh, constructed by Nazis, and uh, there's also a kind of neo-Nazi YouTube channel in Germany where the, the backdrop uh, of this uh, private house is, um, is basically made public. So it's, it's not, again, it's not actually a private house anymore. It's a mix of, of private and public house. We could say similar things about the um, farmhouse of Jörg Haider, um, the former Austrian politician, where again, the idea of the lonesome house in the middle of the countryside is, um, um, became a, a very uh, important and prominent uh, figure for, uh, for a kind of political project. And the next step after the lonesome house is the settlement around uh, 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 crucial houses. Um, in, especially in the eastern part of Germany, where real estate is, where you can buy basically whole villages for very little money, uh, you can see a certain pattern of neo-Nazis moving to villages and um, basically living their life there, based on the idea of white supremacy. Uh, there's uh, one of the most infamous uh, villages is called Yame. You could find there even kind of uh, grills uh, with, uh, um, uh, with the uh, saying, happy holocaust, and uh, also kind of buildings where uh, kind of communal living uh, takes part. Uh, but this, is, this pattern cannot only be detected in Germany, but also, for example, in, in France, where there's a highly disturbing uh, girls' group called Les Brigades. It's a kind of ultra-right-wing right -wing extremist uh, pop band called Les Brigades, who um, produce songs and records with titles France, Notre Terre, France, Our Soil, um, sing songs about um, um, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen and Donald Trump, of course. Um, and they also live in a kind of hippie commune in the middle of the Black Mountains in France and um, basically use a kind of leftist, hippie-esque way of living and turn it to the far right. Um, in order to to establish an example for uh, a kind of communal living based on ethnic purity. We can see similar things in Hungary, where until very recently, uh, there, was a, there is still a village called Erpatak, which used to have a, a mayor, he's not mayor anymore, called Oros, a fascist who forced the children in uh, the kindergarten in Erpatak to sing children's songs um, where they were supposed to sing about dancing uh, uh, on their own future coffins when they have died for the Hungarian um, folk. Uh, and in front of the little um, town hall of Erpatak, there were even um, yeah, uh, kind of anti-Semitic, uh, ex symbolic executions of um, Benjamin Netanyahu and others.
uh, everything combined, of course, with uh, traditional clothing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can find similar patterns also in the U.S. Of course, uh, I mean, there's a whole history. Um, written already about uh, these compounds of, uh, of neo-Nazi groups uh, like ne the National Alliance, etc. Uh, again and again, uh, the pattern in this typology is that uh, uh, people uh, of the same um, kind of, uh, um, yeah, of the same race, so to say, uh, 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 is supposed to live together and um, uh, form a kind of uh, highly disturbing um, way of collective uh, living. And this building brings me to the next example. Especially in the US, uh, we can detect a highly interesting, and of course, also highly disturbing symbiosis or uh, um, combination of two typologies, the camp, you could uh, almost say a concentration camp, plus the church tower. Um, this has a certain reason, because uh, churches in, um, in the US uh, are a good way to avoid taxes. That's why many uh, white supremacy groups in the US started to uh, call their political movement a church, and they added church towers to a com compound living of uh, neo-Nazis and white supremacists. Uh, this uh, headquarter, former headquarter of the Aryan nation is not existing anymore. It was demolished in 2001. Uh, here we see um, uh, images of the uh, deconstruction, but um, this last example brings me to the next and third typology. Um, and this third typology is, goes beyond the idea of the settlement at, uh, in so far as we have to talk also about some kind of symbolic um, um, buildings that represent the community. For example, uh, in the form of stately homes, castles, and um, uh, old manors. There's a whole neo-Nazi history in uh, post-war Germany yet to be written, which can be told in old castles inhabited by neo-Nazis, using public money for, uh, for conservation um, in order to to live there together. That, that's uh, one of the most uh, well-known examples in Germany. It's called uh, Wehrsport Gruppe Hoffmann. They uh, did also a bomb attack on the um, Olympia, um, uh, uh, on the on the, um, um, uh, uh, the Oktoberfest in, in Munich, uh, where several people died. And they used, uh, in the 1980s, 400 militias with weapons and also tanks uh, left on compounds uh, around uh, old castles, around Nuremberg in Franconia uh, mainly. Um, but also the image of the old castle, of the old manor is present in contemporary right-wing politics. Uh, there's a very well-known ultra-right-wing uh, publisher called Götz Kubitschek, uh, New York Times wrote about him and uh, many other newspapers who uh, always stress that they live uh, on uh, in an old Rittergut, an old manor. Um, uh, so you might ask yourself now why why uh, is why have we t why um, do we have to talk about this pattern one reason is definitely that uh, right wing extremists globally hate at least one datum one year which is 1789 the french revolution and uh, many right wing pol political movements uh, try to re-establish an idea of a kind of natural social order uh, that goes uh, back to the uh, time, the feudal times before the French Revolution. There's also a French philosopher, uh, I'm sure you have heard his name already, Renaud Camus, uh, Camus who lives uh, in this castle in France. Uh, that's uh, his uh, library. Uh, he's the author of uh, the book, The Great Replacement, which became also the title um, of uh, this manifesto by Brenton Tarrant, the Christchurch mass murderer. Um, and if we look at the 
diagram in the, or the kind of the diagram in the middle of uh, this manifesto, we see the symbol of the black sun. The black sun is a became a in Germany and also beyond Germany a kind of code for the swastika, which is forbidden uh, in Germany and also in uh, some other countries. It, it is basically the swastika uh, 2.0. Where does this black sun come from? Uh, it, it's coming from this uh, castle in Germany called Webelsburg, um, which was renovated by SS troops uh, during uh, National Socialism. And in one of the towers, you find uh, this black sun uh, designed by uh, a German Nazi architect called Hermann Bartels. And uh, so this is basically the floor pattern that uh, is at the beginning um, of this uh, symbol that became now, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, or for terrible reasons, uh, a kind of global success, if you allow me this word. Um, until now, I've only spoken about the countryside, about more or less rural areas. I started with the Casa Pound in the middle of Rome, but the question now, and maybe also the question here in this room is, what does this have to do with the city, with our kind of uh, more or less liberal, maybe, idea of living together, uh, uh, living based on the idea of uh, difference and tolerance? and. Um, I mentioned already the Casa Pound. Uh, I didn't mention yet that the Casa Pound has a symbol, um, which is this turtle. Uh, so they used um, the image of an um, animal which has its own house, uh, which is which is always carrying uh, its own house with it, um, and that's also the idea of um, of Casa Pound to go into spaces, to derelict spaces, to claim them, and to basically copy a kind of leftist way of claiming spaces um, by ultra right wing um, neo fascists. Um, I mentioned already this. Casa Pound uh, alternative urban infrastructure with uh, neo-fascist bookstores. Um, and I should mention that the model Casa Pound gets um, um, copied right now also in Germany. Until very recently in Leipzig, there was the so-called German Casa Pound. Uh, and uh, so th there are many efforts also from uh, uh, ultra right wing groups in Germany and beyond to go back to the inner city and to learn from the Italians um, uh, uh, in order to reestablish uh, uh, basically um, uh, 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 a fortress um, uh, in the inner city based on the idea of uh, white supremacy, uh, etc. When you talk about uh, the relationship of inner cities and right-wing politics, uh, at least in Germany, we have to talk about reconstruction projects. It's not a surprise that the project of the reconstructed um, Frauenkirche in Dresden, the women's church in Dresden, um, became a tattoo of a, 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 a German neo-Nazi. It is also not a surprise that this building in Potsdam um, uh, gets highly, uh, gets probably reconstructed right now. The uh, the tower uh, is uh, getting reconstructed right now, but uh, the church itself is not clear yet. What is this church about? That's a garrison church in Potsdam, which um, is famous for uh, architectural reasons. It's actually a very important piece of architecture, a, a kind of baroque piece of architecture. But this is also the place where um, um, a kind of deeply problematic handshake uh, took place, the handshake between Adolf Hitler and Hindenburg, the handshake between German conservative conservatism um, and uh, right-wing extremism took place in front of this church in 1933. So this building is the symbol for the alliance of German conservatism and right-wing extremism. And, for, uh, and there was a right-wing extremist in Germany, a neo-Nazi, uh, who actually um, 
financed the reconstruction of the bells of this tower and gave it to the city of Potsdam under the condition that they, if they receive, if they get the bells, that they should reconstruct the whole building. He almost managed to do this, but uh, things are changing right now. But I want to stress that uh, it is not a surprise, obviously, that ultra-right-wing political parties in Germany, like the AfD, is, of course, extremely happy about this reconstruction project. Um, also, the new Frankfurt Old Town is, um, for me, also not a surprise. Actually, the first political initiative for this reconstruction project stems from an ultra-right-wing uh, political group. And I wrote an article at the Frankfurt Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung um, uh, a bit more than a year ago, which created a big debate in, in Germany. And of course, many fans of old cities, and um, no, I also don't have anything against old cities, obviously, uh, were deeply offended uh, that I brought a right-wing extremism um, together or in a certain relationship to these kind of reconstruction projects. The big question in Germany right now is obviously, uh, do reconstructions of the city castle in Berlin, uh, is, are we simply talking about nostalgia here? Or are we provoking a certain change in social behavior? Uh, uh, are we going back to Prussia and its politics? Uh, again, the AfD is very happy about uh, this reconstruction project and also is um, supporting the idea of reconstructing, reconstructing not only the city castle in Berlin, but also the old town around it. Um, when ultra-right-wing politicians in Germany speak about architecture, they also speak about memorials. They speak especially about this Holocaust memorial by Peter Eisenman, and there's one uh, deeply uh, disturbing, uh, terrible quote by an AfD politician called Andre Pockenburg, who said, who criticized uh, this memorial once for its, uh, quote, ugly aesthetics, and he recommended, again, quote, you could put something else there that would take up less space and have far more atmosphere. Similar tendencies we can also detect in Hungary, uh, by the way. Um, in the Ash Plus Ash issue I mentioned, we also, uh, um, my colleague uh, at my institute in, in Stuttgart, uh, she's Hungarian, Jozana Stanitz, wrote about the um, uh, cultural politics in Hungary, wrote about reconstruction projects, but also about the exile of um, kind of liberal or even socialist um, uh, statues of liberal and socialist politicians to the edge of the city, um, while the inner city uh, gets completely redone um, with new memorials. For example, this new memorial from 2014 dedicated to the nation of Hungary, where Hungary is basically portrayed as um, uh, yeah, as a pure victim of uh, the eagle, which is uh, representing Germany. Uh, and these uh, memorials obviously try to ignore long histories of also collaboration, um, which sometimes even lead to uh, this, these situations like this here that Miklos Horthy, uh, one of the um, supporters of Hitler in Hungary, uh, a statue of Miklos Horthy gets constructed in the middle of Budapest. Um, you all probably know that uh, there's also a heavy, uh, kind of heavy debate going on about memorials uh, in the US uh, pr with a completely different political context, obviously. Um, we are here talking about um, um, uh, uh, statues dedicated to uh, Confederate generals like Robert E. Lee. Um, I'm showing here this picture of a kind of far right, uh, some, uh, sometimes even neo-Nazi uh, rally um, who protest against um, uh, kind of the possible removal of these Confederate monuments. Uh, the organizer um, of this rally and many other rallies is Richard Spencer, one one of the um, kind of most important activists of the far right in the US. He, he's running a, um, a pseudo think tank called the National 
Policy Institute. It's actually, uh, it, is, it sounds very r representational, but it's actually just an address somewhere. Um, but the website uh, is, uh, looks very statutory with columns, etc. I tried to find out where these columns come from, and um, I think I found out that these columns are the columns of the Supreme Court uh, in Washington, D.C., um, built uh, in 1935 by the architect Cass Gilbert. And the marble of the stone uh, was given um, to the architect by Benito Mussolini, which brings me, obviously, to um, Maybe, maybe this is just an accident, but I'm uh, more and more convinced that these people really know what they are doing. They know the references. They did their homework. And uh, if we try to criticize this, we, <laughs> we should also do our homework, obviously, and take them serious. Um, which brings me to a very contemporary situation. You have all heard about uh, this new exec executive order by the Trump administration um, called uh, uh, Make Buildings Beautiful Again, I think. Uh, the architectural record um, reported about that. Um, and yeah, with interesting results, uh, the American Renaissance, that's a, that's a newspaper block uh, um, by um, an ultra uh, right wing um, political group called the American Renaissance, a white supremacy um, pressure group in the US. They, um, they uh, published recently uh, this article called Leftist Rage Against Classical Architecture, where they also um, quoted people who criticize people like Leon Klee and others, uh, including myself. This article ends um, with this quote. In a healthy society, buildings connect people to their heritage and history. They offer comfort, beauty, and connectedness. All institutions should do this. Instead, our institutions spread cultural and physical poison, and we see the results everywhere. President Trump's proposed executive order is one small step towards reuniting white Americans with our civilizational tradition. Obviously, highly disturbing sentences. We need to be aware of these sentences because they um, bring it to the point uh, what this project is probably all about. Uh, they bring it to an extreme point, but uh, maybe extremism is already part in the middle of certain societies. Um, the American uh, ultra-right-wing extremism is in a highly interesting schizophrenic state. I would say they either, um, they, on the one hand, they always try to build their identity on the kind of European heritage. On the other hand, they want to, they try to turn it into the, what they call the American greatness. And uh, all, all comes together in this image, and I think, uh, by American right-wing extremists standing in front of the Parthenon copy in Nashville, Tennessee, um, uh, speaking about European roots and American greatness. Um, my fourth point is the following. When we talk about these current developments, we need to talk about old buildings, obviously, but also new media. We need to talk about the role of memes in social media, on Twitter, etc. Uh, there's one artist group called disnovation.org who did a highly interesting political map of certain memes and uh, yeah, uh, obviously architecture is not present there, but we could do uh, the same with architecture images, and we also started to do this in this uh, architecture magazine called H+, where we tried to analyze, and my colleague Philipp Krüppe tried to analyze the uh, role of imagery in German ultra-right-wing extremist groups called Identitäre Bewegung, the Identitarian Movement, um, who which uh, on the one hand use very well-known old buildings for their political propaganda. They even hire an architect who can read plans in order to organize ladders high enough that people can climb up the Brandenburg Gate. And um, 
if we look at, for example, Facebook uh, pages like Architectural Revival, I think it's a British Facebook page as far as I know, we, I mean, that's a highly interesting, highly problematic, obviously, um, Facebook site. Uh, they post memes like this here, revere the local, reject the global, modernism is faceless, soulless, and global. And, uh, for example, this post got retweeted by this uh, um, um, German ultra-right-wing extremist called uh, Robert Tim, who calls himself Schinkel. Um, and these uh, political uh, groups also work with a contradiction, good versus bad. And that's a, that's a rhetorical model established in German architecture theory by a, a, an architect and theorist uh, called Paul Schulze Naumburg, who was um, uh, yeah, a deeply reactionary um, uh, person who, who was re also responsible for the blood and soil, the blut and boden ideology, who established in his publications this good versus bad um, propaganda. And yeah, we see similar patterns also uh, on f Facebook uh, groups like Architectural Revival. In this post on the left-hand side, they even say modernism is demoralizing a concrete box proposed for Cologne. The removal of German identity assists the replacement of German people. There it is again, the idea of the great replacement I mentioned before. Um, I would like to conclude um, with uh, a new interpretation of AA, not anti, uh, Antifa architecture, but anarcho-capitalist architecture. Uh, we shouldn't, when, we, when we're here at the AA, a place um, I deeply admire, we, we shouldn't um, claim that uh, we are talking about things that are far away. Um, on the one hand, uh, I mentioned already Leon Crea, who um, uh, is always referring to this idea of being the artist, uh, constructing Poundbury. We should not ignore that the, the imagery of Poundbury played a crucial role in certain UKIP propaganda films, like Building for the Future from 2013. Um, we should not ignore, and I know many people who didn't ignore, uh, the role of Roger Scruton um, in uh, all, all these developments. Uh, Kit Malthouse, the former uh, Ministry of Building, um, was very close to uh, these tendencies represented by Roger Scruton and Leon Crea. Um, but I would like to also to mention that um, we should be maybe a bit more aware of uh, how, where right-wing publishing houses are actually situated in the city here in London. There's one very prominent publishing house called Arctos. Um, probably um, um, not many people have heard of this uh, publishing house, but it's the most important English-speaking speaking publishing house for ultra-right-wing publications. Um, uh, and if you look at the addresses, I mean, they are very close by. They are actually here on Eversholt uh, Street, right north of um, Houston Station. Uh, the CEO uh, is uh, of America, uh, a Swedish um, uh, right-wing extremist called Daniel Freeberg, who's financing many um, initiatives in this direction. So we are, it's, it's, it's not far away. Uh, these sentences we are talking about. Also, Cambridge Analytica was only eight, the former headquarter of Cambridge Analytica was only 800 meters away from here until it was closed down, I think, in 2018. One of uh, the crucial companies who made uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, the Leaf campaign possible. Um, uh, also, the successor of this company called Emma Data Limited is based here in London, financed by the Mercer uh, family, uh, who is also financing ultra-right-wing groups in the US. Uh, their headquarter is in Canary Wharf. Um, which brings me to my last point. Um, until now, I have more or less speaking about only one corner in this diagram. The uh, bottom right corner. Um, where does the AA comes, come into, into the play? Uh, obviously, Patrick Schumacher is, uh, uh, he's, uh, 
uh, I think there, uh, he's probably, uh, I, I like him personally uh, um, uh, a lot. Uh, I met him only once. Uh, he's a very friendly person, very open also for discussions, which I really like, um, but which shouldn't um, um, uh, mean that uh, uh, we, sh we shouldn't criticize him. Uh, and I'm sure also this takes place also at this school. Um, but I wouldn't place him, obviously, in the bottom right corner, but now in the bottom uh, top, uh, in, in the top uh, right corner now. And I'm talking about an intellectual and practicing architect who started, we all know this, as a Marxist, so probably on the the um, top left corner moved via systems theory and Nicholas Luhmann somewhere to the Austrian school. Uh, the American right-wing libertarian um, publisher Tom E. Woods even uh, posted this on Twitter and Facebook a couple of, um, in 2017, uh, where he basically said, Patrick Schumacher, a major voice in architecture and a former Marxist, says, I converted him to Austrian economics to people like Ludwig von Mises and uh, Friedrich von Hayek. He's now enraging the bad guys by calling for privatization of all public spaces, including uh, roads, and denouncing state involvement in pretty much anything. Um, you probably all know more or less uh, the consequences of this debate. Uh, the Guardian, um, uh, Oliver Wainwright once uh, uh, kind of titled, Zaha did successes, crap art schools, privatized cities, and bin social housing, which caused uh, a lot of problems also for Zaha did architects. Even the Evening Standard uh, put um, uh, his uh, ideas uh, about cities on the cover, and the Antifa um, uh, tried to organize protests with slogans like Sack Schumacher, or the siege goes on. Um, we've also seen these scenes, so Antifa protests in front of the uh, of Saadid architects, uh, where even posters like this here were shown, and also this poster here, which is deeply wrong, I think, in my opinion, um, because it misunderstands the nature of the doubled right. Uh, Patrick Schumer is definitely not a fascist, nor a racist, or something like that, but he's an ultra-right-wing um, uh, activist and also practicing architect who says things that, uh, way, uh, that should be criticized, at least in my opinion. Um, and in order to understand you a bit better, I would like to re-import um, um, some quotes of, um, um, of an interview Patrick Schumacher gave uh, to uh, the big German newspaper called Die Zeit. I translated some of the keys, uh, some of the quotes. Um, in the future, Patrick Schumacher says, would better, quote, would better rely on the self-regulating forces of the market. The 2008 crisis is the result of government intervention, which has blocked self-regulating market forces. Or, in the United States, we've completed very nice projects, but the high-end business there has slowed down due, due to government intervention. There are now new, there are now new anti-money laundering laws in the U.S. Uh, in the United States, especially in Miami, where a few years ago the Latin Americans arrived with suitcases full of money. The business is over. Or. If interns want to join us without a salary, the state shouldn't prohibit it. Or if people don't feel compelled, they won't get out of bed at all. When I worked at the university in Berlin, I totally laced around. Or there would be a lot less vacancy if you could move out tenants within a week. Or and that's the last quote, no, uh, um, uh, one, uh, two more. Not all income groups have to be in the city center. My employees should live here in the city, in the city center, because they go to the exhibitions, to the pub, have to go to cultural institutions to continue their education. The security guards and the cleaning staff have different priorities, different career developments. They don't need to live in the city. They work less hard. If they sit on the train an hour longer, it's not tragic. 
Last quote, architects are in charge of the form of the built environment. We need to grasp this and run with it despite all the moralizing political correctness that is trying to paralyze us with bad consciousness. Not a surprise that um, Patrick Schumacher and Saadid architects uh, looked for a certain alliance with um, the Trump family with Jeff Kushner uh, where they designed uh, this 666 Fifth Avenue tower which won't um, be built. I'm terribly sorry for the bad news, but I'm done. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>